Next up is uh, Howard Wu, uh, co-founder and CTO of uh, Al of uh, Alio, sorry. Uh, Alio is the first ZK Layer 1 uh, to fully privatize uh, applications and today is Howard is going to introduce the concept of zero knowledge proofs and show uh, how to build zero knowledge applications on Alio. So uh, please a warm welcome to uh, Howard. All right. Um, hi everyone. My name is Howard. Uh, I'm a uh, co-founder and CTO of Alio. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, decentralized private computations on Alio. And I hope for those who have heard about zero knowledge proofs that uh, this will be an opportunity to help demystify some of the uh, things that you have seen uh, with regards to programming in zero knowledge. People tend to think of zero knowledge as a very uh, complex and esoteric field. And you know, I want to say that uh, historically it has been. Uh, but my goal today is to help uh, make it uh, far more clear for everyone that uh, you know, the space has advanced significantly, that it's much easier to program in the, in the space today, and uh, I encourage every developer here to try it today. Um, this talk will be broken up into two parts, so the first half will go over uh, an introduction to zero-knowledge proofs, an introduction to Alio itself, and the developer stack that we're building, and then we'll take a quick five-minute break, and then we'll transition into the second half, where we'll go into live demos. I will be presenting um, applications uh, live on screen for you guys, and we'll also give uh, an opportunity for everyone in the audience to follow along with GitHub repos. So um, if you have brought your laptop for the second half, you can install our tool stack with us, and I can run examples with you guys together. And so uh, with that, uh, we'll jump right into things uh, right after we get this technical stuff figured out. Okay, so let's get started. Um, Alio was born out of a research project, actually, from many years ago. Um, originally, the intuition that we had was to say, you know, could you build a new L1 that could be both fully programmable and fully private? Um, if you think about Bitcoin today, it's very low in programmability, very low in privacy. Ethereum went one direction to offer high programmability. Zcash went the other to offer high privacy. But there was this upper right-hand quadrant of high programmability and high privacy that was really missing in the market. And so we, we, as researchers, had said, could we devise a purely cryptographic, purely mathematical scheme to, to actually solve that, that part of the, the space? And, and that was where Zexi was born. Zexi stands for Zero Knowledge Executions. It was a paper that we published in Oakland 2020. And it, it basically allowed you to design a protocol that could be for decentralized private computations. Now, today, what I want to talk about are really three, three things. The first is, I think there's been a lot of buzz about zero knowledge proofs and ZK SNARK specifically. I want to demystify what this means by introducing to you the technology and explaining to you how it works. The second part is to say, I want to show you how to use zero knowledge to go and build a layer one off of it. And lastly, to show you how we instantiated a zero knowledge, uh, a ZKL1, um, which we call Alio. So let's begin. I think it's important to start by saying cryptography is a very powerful tool. I think for those in this audience, they already recognize and you, you already have seen this in the wild today. Um, but today, cryptography is really used to offer security properties for data. And what I mean by that is that when I want to send a message from me to you, um, I want to make sure that the contents are private. Uh, in order to do that, I use encryption in order to encrypt the data so that it doesn't reveal uh, to the other, to, to outside parties, what we are talking about. But in addition, we also use cryptography for authenticity. And what that means is that when I send a message from me to you, uh, you want to make sure that this message truly came from me and it was not tampered by some party in the middle uh, who potentially could have compromised the contents of that message. From that perspective, we haven't really thought about computations, and cryptography has not been used heavily in the, in, for computations. And so the question is, what about security properties for it? Well, we have this new field called cryptographic proofs. Cryptographic proofs offer privacy-preserving integrity for computations. That's a lot of words to say something very simple, which is to say, I want to securely compute y such that, f of, uh, such that f of x is equal to y. And I want to be able to convince another party that I actually computed this correctly. If you dive even further, there's actually an, an even more specific type of cryptographic proof called a zero knowledge proof. And a zero knowledge proof is a privacy preserving cryptographic proof of computational integrity. Again, a lot of words to say something quite straightforward, which is that 
I know x such that y equals f of x. In this case, x here is red because what I'm trying to convey is that x itself may be private. When you're, when you're in an online setting on the web, a zero knowledge proof can be very useful because, well, first off, you want to convince other parties that I know something or, th or that I did something and have others be able to quickly check that that's true. But oftentimes when you're on the web, you also don't want to reveal your personal data in order to convince another party of some outcome. And so this is an opportunity to use a technology to actually hide my inputs and still convey the same outputs. In English, the short is to say, I know the secret. I can't tell you the secret, but I can prove to you that I know the secret. And I think that this is the essence of what, what zero knowledge proofs is really getting at. To show you an example of this concretely, let's take, for example, uh, the, the fun puzzle of Where's Waldo? It's a very canonical example when explaining zero knowledge proofs. Um, I have here a map of Waldo. What I would like to do is for you to prove to me that you found Waldo without telling me where he is on the map. If, if you just, you know, the, the naive solution is to just point on the map and show me where Waldo is, but then it's no fun for, for, the, for the other person because they now know and, and they can't play this game. But maybe they want to be convinced Waldo's really on this map. You know, maybe there's some sick April Fool's joke where people put these where, where's Waldo maps on the internet with, without Waldo in it. It's like, this is not a, <laughs> it's, it's, it wouldn't be a fun, fun experience for anybody. So um, uh, th this is an example where uh, if you want to actually convey this exact property, what you do is you'd get a giant sheet of white paper far bigger than the map and you'd cover the whole thing. You'd cut a little hole out that's centered right on where Waldo is and then you'd have this other person come into the room and have them look at that hole and see Waldo is really there on the map and then have them take a step out of the room, remove the white piece of paper and have them come back in the room and they see the entire map again. From that perspective, the, the onlooker who came into the room would not know where Waldo is on, is on the map, but they would be convinced that Waldo truly exists on the map. And that's like a very simple human example of a zero knowledge proof. Let me give you one more example. This is called the Alibaba Cave. This one's also very classical. Um, it was originally published in a paper from 1989 called uh, How to Explain Zero Knowledge Proofs to Your Children. Now, I'm not sure who's explaining zero knowledge proofs to their children, but uh, <laughs> you know, I applaud them for doing that. The, the example works basically as so. Um, you have this cave, and there's two parties. There's Alice and there's Bob. Alice walks into the cave and can pick with a coin flip whether to go over to A or to go over to B. Once she is in the cave and has picked a side, Bob will flip a coin, and Bob will say, hey, I want you to come out of side A. Now, if, if Alice is in side B, she must have a key to open a door that can let her come out on side A. The reality is that if she has the key, she can open the door and she can come out. If she doesn't have the key, then with probability one half at that position, she may or may not be able to come out. And so this, this shows to you that by flipping coins and coming into the cave and then having the other party challenge you to say, hey, I want you to come out of X side or A side or B side, um, you can play this probabilistic game that eventually you'll be convinced as Bob that either Alice truly has the key and can always come out the right side because she has the key or she really cannot come out, come out because she doesn't have the key. So that was a very high level way of explaining zero knowledge proofs. Let's dive further in, into a lower and more technical level. Um, the first zero knowledge proof was actually invented in uh, 1989 by Goldwasser, McCallie and Rakoff. And uh, in that model, there was two parties. There was someone called a prover and someone called a verifier. The prover had knowledge of that function f that we talked about, the claimed output y, and also a private input x. The verifier, who is of equal size, has a function f and a claimed output y. What happens is that the prover will say, hey, I know x such that f, y equals f of x. And the verifier will say, prove to me that you know x. You know, I don't believe you. And what happens from there is that the verifier will send a challenge over to the prover. The prover will send a response back. The verifier sends another challenge. The prover sends another response back. It's this interactive protocol where he basically starts to play, similar to the Alibaba cave, where you start to play this game, where you say, go into the cave, come out one side. Go into the cave, come out the other side. Go into the cave, come out this side. It's, an, it's a game to basically get you to convince the other party that indeed you actually know some secret, like I have the key to the door. This 
basic premise was actually formalized in this paper. It showed mathematically that it was actually achievable, but it had a lot of trade-offs. In fact, at the time, um, well, first off, we have this protocol that's interactive. And as you can imagine, on the web, this is a very hard requirement to make on people because you know, in order for you to convince someone of something with a zero knowledge proof, you're saying you need to have both parties be online at the same time, talking to each other, and be in constant communication back and forth in order to convince a party of some secret or knowledge. It's not a very convenient model. I'd say also, secondly, it's not succinct. What I mean by that is that in order for the verifier to be convinced that the prover knows the secret, they have to have a proof that is effectively of the same size or of the same order of the problem itself, that, that it's, it's far, far less efficient. It's, it's as expensive as it is to compute the function itself, and therefore it's not a very efficient check. Lastly, of course, is that it's poor efficiency, that the prover himself to actually like, convince the verifier has to do a lot of computations. And so, we actually evolved from there, and in 1994, Sylvia McCauley published a paper that showed the first succinct non-interactive zero-knowledge proof. What do I mean by that? Well, again, you have a prover, and you have a verifier. In this case, the verifier I've drawn to be much smaller because the verifier is now succinct. In this model, the prover once again claims, hey, I know x such that y equals f of x. And the verifier once again says, prove to me that you know x. Now, instead of going back and forth, back and forth with random sample challenges, they use something called a random oracle. You could think about it like SHA-256 or like Poseidon. The idea is to say that both parties establish some type of a hash function that they all agree upon with a starting input, and they can simulate that type of interaction that they were doing before without needing to actually communicate in real time with each other. This saves on the amount of work, this saves on the overhead, this, this removes the interactivity requirement, and at the end of the process, the prover only has to send over one proof over to the verifier. This model that I just described is actually the first ZK snark. And now you may be wondering, what is a ZK snark? So let's, let's talk about that. So a ZK snark has, well, it's a lot of jargon that stands for, for something quite big. Um, it is a zero knowledge, succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge. What do I mean by this? Well, for zero knowledge, it means that the proof does not reveal the witness. The witness here is like the private input. The, the zero, a zero knowledge proof should not reveal to you your private input X. Secondly, it's succinct. That means proofs are small and the verification should be fast. Third, it's non-interactive. What this means is that it's, there's no interaction that's necessary between the prover and the verifier. Recall in the first example, I had said that the prover and the verifier both have to be online at the same time in constant communication with each other. It's a very hard requirement on the internet to do that. Imagine if I wanted to send money to you, and I've never met you before right, because you're a stranger on the internet, and like I'm saying, you have to come online when I come online in order for me to convince you that I sent you a payment. Like it's a very hard ask. And so like non-interactivity is a really good property to have. And lastly, it's an argument. This is more of a technical description, but it's saying that soundness holds against a polynomially bounded verifier. So there's proofs of knowledge and there's arguments of knowledge. This is an argument of knowledge. Now the question is to say, how do I use this to basically build a, a, a layer one with it? And so let's talk about this next step. What I'm going to do is to basically say, using, using a zero knowledge proof as a, as a foundational primitive, I'm going to start by, by introducing the account model, which everyone here may have seen from Ethereum. Uh, I will refresh everyone who has, and I'll introduce it for those who haven't. Um, and then talk about some of the challenges of trying to add privacy onto the account model. And then next, demonstrate what we call the record model, which is the extension of the account model to support full privacy in the account model. And lastly, we'll talk about implementations on those fronts. So let's jump into it. Well, to start, the first thing to talk about is that I want to motivate why we're doing this, which is to say that people are building all sorts of applications now on decentralized ledgers. Things from micropayments, trade and finance, NFTs, domain names, storage, bridges, you name it. There's all types of applications that are now being built on decentralized ledgers. 
However, this type of technology comes with significant limitations. We're very much in the early days of this, of this infrastructure. And let me show you the pain points that I'm really talking about here. The first is to say that, that the way blockchains work is by re-executing computations. This seems fairly reasonable until you actually see some of the pain points. Let me show you one. The first is to say when the user submits a transaction, they specify first the application, the input, and a signature authenticating that this transaction came from them. They'll deploy this over to the network. The network then receives this and attempts to run it. They're going to check by having every single node in the network re-execute this exact same computation. And if the computation is valid and the signature is valid, then the state for that application is updated, as you can see in green there. Now, the problem with this is that this really hurts scalability. Why? By having every party re-execute each transaction to ensure the integrity of its ledger, you're wasting a lot of work. To give you a, a very basic example, if you take Ethereum, ETH1 really, um, which had 3,000 nodes on it, uh, uh, and this was checked right before the merge, um, if you just assume there was just only five seconds of computations in each block, and remember, this, the, there's, there's ten, it's like 13 second blocks. 3,000 nodes times five seconds is already 15,000 seconds of re-execution. 15,000 seconds is about four hours of work. So every, every 13 seconds, you're producing four hours of work for people to compute. That's a lot of re-execution that's happening under the hood here to make this work. And the short of it is it's very wasteful. The second thing is that by having everyone re-execute the ledger, you're really hurting privacy. Why? Because this model requires you to reveal to everybody your account, so your identity. It has to reveal to everyone what you're calling, what the inputs you're passing in for the call, and then the outputs of that call. It reveals a lot of details about the entire application use case that you're using, and it becomes something that's easily trackable. The example that I like to give is to say, if I want to send you money, and you give me your bank account, number? Well, if I know your bank account number, I don't learn anything about how much money you have, how much money you make, uh, how much money you spend, where you spend it, why you spent it, when you spent it. I don't learn any of these. But if you give me your Ethereum address and I send you USDC, I'm going to learn all of these things about you. And I can even track you for the rest of time with that. And like from that perspective, you want to build a system, especially from a compliance standpoint, that can actually give you full privacy. It would also be really weird if like, you're, if you're married and you want to buy an anniversary gift for your spouse and they can just look uh, at your account and see how much you spent and where you spent it. and also when you remembered their anniversary was coming up, it's, uh, it can be kind of awkward. So I think that there's a UI UX component here to privacy as well, but I just thought I'd bring it up. I hope this helps to motivate the idea. Um, and so we, we built something called Alio. Alio itself is an autonomous ledger executions off chain. The idea is to say, I can build a decentralized ledger that lets you execute programs off-chain and then finalize state on-chain. The benefits of a system of this is that, one, you get scalability. Why? You don't have to re-execute anymore. People can execute themselves, produce a zero-knowledge proof, and then send it to the network. The network only has to check a proof, which is very small, and I'll talk about that here. But the second thing is that you get privacy. So in terms of privacy, because you're executing it off-chain, no user data has to actually appear on-chain. You can obviously disclose it on-chain if you wish, but that's up to you. And lastly, it's succinct. And so there's a mathematical kind of basis to it that says that transactions can be validated in poly-K time. But the short of it is, is to say that transactions can be quite small, about a kilobyte, and they can be verified very quickly in less than 50 milliseconds. This gives you a more performance system that also offers you far greater privacy. And with respect to the programs that you can build on here, what we offer is the ability to have user-defined programs while executing them in a sandbox environment so that malicious programs can't infect or impact honest ones. And lastly, offer the ability for inter-process communication that programs can talk to each other if they want. So to see how we got there, let's start with the account model. The account model is the Ethereum model that I think many people have heard of or are familiar with or have interacted or helped contribute to. 
And the short of it is that the account model is a decentralized ledger that tracks each account via global state. So let me just show you what it looks like. You know, a user typically comes and says, hey, like, I want you to execute this thing for me. Here's the transaction, and I signed it. Then it gets put into a block. The block gets put on chain. On chain, every node says, oh, this computation's valid. Let me update my global state. So you see the state transition here. The, there's some account that they're referencing with some balance. There's some code for it and some storage. And then they make the transition, and we have balance prime, the same code as before, and then storage prime. It's like the state update that they're making. That's the account model in a nutshell. What are the trade-offs? Well, first off, the great thing is that it's very simple. Why? Because it's, by having this global state, it's easy for everybody to just see, ah, like there's this one place that the data truly lives at, and we can each interface with it, and there's you know, a network that's going to go and manage it for you. It's very simple. It's, it's great. But there's also trade-offs, right? And we've seen this in practice. You know, the problem is that there's, real, there's a real scaling problem. Uh, and, and in fact, there's also a very high fee problem. That is the, the dual, the, the direct correlation of it. It's saying that when a lot of people want to use it because it's getting popular, the challenge is now you're paying these exorbitant fees because it's you on top of the next guy, or, or you're trying to beat the next guy to the punch. And one of the weird things about Ethereum's model is that th the next user that comes onto the platform is actually a net negative for the ecosystem because you're only making it harder for the existing users to transact in the system by having one more person come into the, to the network. It's, it's what I kind of call like the mainframe model, that in mainframes, you don't want to timeshare too much because then no one gets a chance to actually get their time on the mainframe. And so like, this is kind of one of the big challenges in this design. And, and of course, I've already alluded to this a few times, but there's, there's no privacy in this model that you can kind of reveal your state and everyone can see what's happening there. It's both a huge advantage. It's, it's a blessing and a curse is, is the short way to describe it. So the solution is why don't we sprinkle some ZK snarks on it and just solve it once and for all. Um, the attempt that I'm going to start with is to, is to say, what's the most naturally motivated way to actually add privacy into the account model? Well, the intuition is I want to think private smart contracts. How do I do that? The first thing I might want to do is to say that transaction that we were sending earlier, when we were sending the, the value, the data, and the signature, and the clear for everybody to see, what if instead I committed to the value so that it's a commitment and it's hidden? Uh, I encrypt the data so that no one can read it besides me. And uh, I add, instead of signatures, we add cryptographic proofs uh, on the computation. Seems fairly reasonable. And for, for global state storage, that account that was holding the balance, the code, and the storage, you know, what could we do here? Well, one thing we could do is to say, let's commit to the balance on chain. So again, we hide it. Um, let's, let's predicate this code. So let's turn this code into a polynomial, a mathematical representation, so that we can reason about it in a zero knowledge proof. And lastly, why don't we encrypt the storage so, again, no one can see the storage on chain. This seems like the kind of immediate intuition that everyone will go to in order to do this. And just to mathematically show this uh, very quickly, um, oh, not this one, but um, this, so this is the combined model. And to mathematically kind of show the intuition is to say, in each transaction, what would this proof actually be claiming then uh, for the computation? Well, we would basically be saying, hey, like we have some code here for this program that I want to run. Um, I have some state that is the existing state of that application on chain. I'm going to pass into it the commitment of that balance and also the encrypted storage that we just talked about. And what I'm going to do in a zero knowledge proof is to compute the entire state transition of the entire account. So what I'm going to claim now is that, hey, here's the old state you can replace it safely with this new state. And this new state has some committed balance and some new encrypted storage state. That's the rough intuition of what, what I want to do. Logically, what am I really checking? I'm first checking that I'm not minting money out of thin air. So I need to check that the commitments of these balances still sum out to zero. So I'm not minting any new money out of thin air. The second thing that I need to check is that the code itself was executed correctly and there's a very formal way to kind of specify that, but the intuition is to say, I want to create an, a runtime environment where I execute this proof system with this data, and this data will result in the correct state transition. So this sounds really good, right? Sorry to break your bubble, but <laughs> let's see why this doesn't work. Um, the first thing is concurrent access is broken here. 
What I mean by that is this. Say user A comes and says, hey, like, I want to create a transaction to update program A. Great, no problems there. But at the same time, remember, we had to take the entire state in. So the second guy comes and says, I also want to update this program A. Well, the problem is their state's going to be invalidated. They can produce a zero knowledge proof that's correct for this transaction and send it. But the problem is that the state is going to be invalidated ready because the first guy just ingested the state and produced a new state transition and the next guy was still using the old state. It will look like a double spend. That's the main problem. And of course, there's no privacy in the account model. I don't know how many more times I have to emphasize this one, but um, everyone can now see that user one updated program A. That's, that's the main challenge there. So in terms of formally kind of thinking through these properties, there are a few benefits we already netted out on. The, whoops, the first is that um, we can use zero knowledge proofs to achieve succinctness um, and we can achieve on-chain scalability, why? Because off-chain, you can execute these things and check them very succinctly on-chain. So if I'm running a program that is, for example, gosh, I don't know, a minute to run, on Ethereum, this is not possible because you don't get a, a minute worth of runtime. You get 10 million uh, gas limits and it does not add up to, <laughs> to, to a minute. So um, you know, here I can at least start to do that, which is cool. The second thing is you get data privacy. And what I mean by that is that we have commitments and encryption and this is going to hide that program state so that at least the data that's stored on chain does not reveal to you, you know, to reveal to the public what you're doing. However, we don't have account privacy. Um, why? Because the addresses themselves can't be encrypted because it's called the account model. And the account model, by definition, has to index by your account address. And so like, that is a foundational limitation of the system's design itself. And lastly, we don't have efficient state updates because again, that code, the code has to consume the entire program state in order to be updated. Like you have to take the entire state of that one account and update with one transition the entire account, which is not a great solution. And for the exact same reasons, then you don't get concurrency because party A is gonna come in and say, I'm gonna update account state. Party B at the same time says, I also wanna update it. Party A state might get accepted, but then party B state gets invalidated. And so this is the problem of concurrency here. So we propose what we call the record model. The record model is effectively an extension of the account model to support the challenges we just ran into with the last three properties there. In this model, we have a new layer of abstraction, which we call transitions. Transitions are basically an object that is based around a transaction that has in it a few things. The ID of the program, some old records, some new records, the fee, and, and, and proofs. I'll talk about these in just a moment. Once the transaction gets admitted into a block, just as before, it's updated with global state, and global state looks similar to before, but with a new layer of abstraction once again. We have these things called records. Records basically are containers that hold the actual owner that's encrypted, the balance, which is committed, and the data, which is also encrypted. And by having data held in this model, we now have a separation of the account from the actual, uh, from the actual program itself. And this gives us the ability to start reasoning in a different model. Let me show you. The first thing that I'm going to claim is that this model gives you concurrency. What I mean by that is that users should be able to consume records associated with the context for their program execution. And I'm also claiming that there's going to be no double spends. What I mean by that is that the, the decentralized ledger should be able to enforce that no record can be spent twice. So that expression that we were talking about earlier, more formally, we have here now uh, given the code predicates and also the records, we're claiming some new set of records. You can think about records like that state that we were just talking about. And when I'm checking, I'm once again checking that the value balance is being conserved. But now what the predicate takes as input is not the entire account's state. In fact, what it's taking is purely just the records associated with your account in that program. 
So by moving things into a lower level abstraction, I now can dedupe the account from the actual uh, state that's owned by, by the global state system itself, and I can just produce proofs on the records themselves. This seems like a very, very simple abstraction. You'd be surprised how crazy complex it is to do in the math, but <laughs> um, this, this, is the, this is the crux of the intuition there. And, and the benefit, of course, is because we decoupled the accounts from programs, then what you get is a decentralized ledger that can now index global state based on program IDs, not based on account addresses. And even more so, we get efficient state updates. Why? Because the code only needs to consume records that are being updated. And for the exact same reason, that means that two parties in one program will own disjoint records, and by owning disjoint records, they each can spend with the same predicates their state in order to produce new records without needing to bash with each other or inter intersect or interfere with each other. This creates a, a separation of responsibility, a separation of execution environment. It gives the, the safety that we talked about in terms of isolation between honest and malicious programs as well. And this is the model that we use in order to actually achieve concurrency then. So the last thing which I want to get into is just how did we build this thing? What does it look like? And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, preface it for, for part two, which is to say, what can you do with it? <laughs> um, well, the first is to just say that building this thing was not easy. Uh, Ailey was at the intersection of a ton of disciplines, from mathematics to complexity theory, cryptography, computer security, and programming languages. Um, we, had to, we had to dive into many different facets of many different computer science disciplines and mathematics disciplines in order to go and actually achieve Alio as a ZKL1. In order to actually instantiate the system, we had to sample a set of elliptic curves, the first of which is called BLS12377. This type of curve is a pairing-friendly curve. And, and what that means is that this allows for fast zero-knowledge proof verification. So if you recall earlier when we had the prover and the verifier, the verifier receives this final proof from the prover and has to check that. We want that check to be as fast as possible. And the easiest way to make that fast is by picking a curve that can, well, in this case, support pairings. In practice, we're talking about like five or six milliseconds to check one proof. That's the concrete number. Secondly, we also sampled another curve that's actually related to it. It's like a, you can call it like a cousin, uh, called the Twisted Edwards Curve. It's, a, it's an Edwards BLS12 curve. And we, we do a lot of uh, uh, efficient cryptographic primitives on here. So things like Peterson hash functions and commitments are executed on here uh, because the computations are very efficient on this specific curve. And for the SNARK, the zero knowledge proof system, we're using a, a proof system called Marlin. Uh, Marlin is a universal and updatable zero knowledge proof system. Um, the universality of it allows us to sample one uh, universal SRS for the entire system. This means developers, when they deploy, merely have to deploy their, their core logic and anyone can derive what we call the proving key and verifying keys to execute and verify the actual program state themselves. They don't need to do any type of additional setups that you may have seen, especially if you are on Twitter. <laughs> um, Marlin itself was published in Eurocrypt 2020, uh, so it's a peer-reviewed uh, body of work, and uh, we continue to improve its performance characteristics since it was originally published. It's, I think, now like doubled or quadrupled in performance speed from the original paper. But yeah, the uh, main selling point of using Marlin is, is that we have universality, and universality is a very big deal if you want to create a developer ecosystem for this. In terms of the system that we ended up building, well, we ended up filling this upper right-hand quadrant that is for private applications. A system like this, because it can execute off-chain, does not require gas fees. And even more so, the thing that excites me the most as a developer is to say that I can write applications that take longer than, say, 100 milliseconds to run. I can write, I can write you know, for example, machine learning code in this that can now run on a blockchain. Why? Because I'm not bounded by re-execution of, every, of everybody. If everyone had to re-execute my deep learning model, you know, tough luck. Like, we'll, be, we'll all be stalled here for, for the rest of time. So like, th this, is, this is the biggest value proposition, in my opinion, as a developer. It's that expressivity to be able to write programs that that are far more performant, far more interesting than what we've seen in smart contracts today. And I'll show you some examples in, in part two. 
Lastly, to show you how we've architected things, there's really three parties in a system like this. There's uh, validators, there's developers, and there's provers. The idea is that developers write applications. They can then send them over to provers. Provers are the ones who actually execute applications. They're these special purpose compute resources that are really highly performant for executing zero-knowledge proofs. And lastly, when they execute zero-knowledge proofs, everything they execute turns into a transaction. The transaction is broadcast to the network, which is run by validators. Validators will check the transaction and basically admit it into the, into the blockchain. And uh, developers can query the blockchain to actually get back the results. That's the, that's the user flow of how we operate. In terms of how a developer will think about it, you know, they want to write code in what we call Leo. This is a programming language that we've been developing. Um, once they've developed that, it gets deployed onto provers. Provers run it. And uh, provers then deploy transactions onto the ledger into block 503, I guess. <laughs> Um, under the hood, how does it work? Well, this is the part that I find most interesting, and this is what I'm going to be talking about mostly in part two. Um, we have a high-level language that's called Leo. It's very much like TypeScript slash Rust in the sense that it's syntactically like TypeScript. It's very strongly typed. It borrows from a few co uh, concepts uh, within Rust to help make it even more expressive for zero-knowledge uh, applications. Um, and under the hood, we compile it down into what we call alien instructions. Alien instructions is a assembly-like language that uh, for a lot of the ZK uh, developers who are counting every single constraint and trying to optimize their, their circuits to be as performant as possible, they tend to prefer writing in alien instructions. Um, and then lastly, uh, alien instructions gets compiled down into bytecode. Bytecode is what lives on chain. It's what lives for perpetuity. It's what we use to basically represent every program. So when I send money to you um, and there's a token contract, you're really going to pull this bytecode and, and you know, obviously the wallet does it for you, but the wallet will take the bytecode, synthesize the keys for you, execute the proof for you, and you'll see in the, in the next demo, it takes about two seconds to do this. This is just a sneak preview at what this looks like, and it's really to, to, to give you a feel that the syntax for even the assembly language is quite high level. Um, you're already able to kind of parse what's going on. It's a typed system. Uh, in here, we can input two field elements. Uh, fields are algebraic fields here, so for those who are unfamiliar, think about it like, uh, like modular integers, like modular arithmetic. Um, if you say I'm, you know, uh, 3 mod 7, then if you go 8 mod 7, you go back to 1. So um, it's just modular numbers uh, is one way to think about it. But uh, here I'm basically inputting two things. I want to multiply them and output it into R2. Register 2 then is what's returned and I can give it visibility. I can say I want it to be public or I want it to be private. And on chain, what gets stored is either the public or the private state of it. So if I say I want it to be private, on chain it, it's encrypted under my account so that only I can see it. If I want it to be public, then it will be just stored in the plane on chain and everyone can see it, including myself. All right, so we're, we're going to break for part two. Before we do that, the first thing I want to say is Alio is proudly written in Rust. Um, it's open source. Uh, there's 40 plus contributors, 65,000 plus lines of code and growing, uh, which sometimes can be fearful. <laughs> um, we are proudly open source as well. It's all available on GitHub. Um, and we just launched Testnet 3. Testnet 3 is now live for those who are interested. Um, stay for part two. We're going to go through the, the, a lot of the development fronts. Um, there are developer docs available at developer.ala.org if you want to try it out there. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, for those who are sticking around for part two, one of the things that we did ask uh, was to try to install the prerequisites. But for those who have not uh, done that yet, no problem. Um, I'm going to leave this up for, for the next five minutes uh, uh, just to say that uh, there are some prerequisites that you're going to need. You're going to need Git, you're going to need Rust, and you're going to need an IDE, I, uh, preferably VS Code. Um, what I'm going to do is basically do a live demo of six applications. Um, and you're welcome to follow along on your, on your machine as well. We'll go through this in just a bit. But um, yeah, with that, I just want to say uh, thank you and, uh, and stay tuned. Yeah, if there are questions, I'm also happy to answer. Yes. That's a great question. Uh, so I think one of the, so I, I personally am not at the heart of that, that particular discussion, but from what I've learned and from what I've seen, I believe performance was a big issue <laughs> with respect <laughs> to... 
I, I believe performance was one of the big issues there. Like, you know, as you know, ZK Snarks have uh, taken a long time to get to, to uh, well, real world performance. And if you actually look back when Zcash first launched in 2016, uh, the first version of Zcash, to, and that's just to send payments. I just want to send a token from me to you. It took about two minutes on my MacBook, and my MacBook was crying by the end of those two minutes. It, it was a very painful experience. And if you fast forward just two years later to 2018, uh, Sapling came out, and in Sapling, sending payments was really, really fast. Uh, it was about three seconds on a mobile device. Like that's how quick it, it advanced. And like now we're in 2022, which is four years since then, and ZK has gotten even faster. There's, there's, there's someone should, should create it, but there's like a Moore's law of ZK that's happening. And you know, today I would say ZK is reaching that point where you're competitive enough to match Ethereum's uh, throughput. But I believe that if you just fast forward another year or two, you're going to start to see these doublings continue, where like traditional software stacks won't be able to in in the in the crypto space won't be able to outperform the ZK bits there. That that's for me, from my perspective, that we're just very early. And in, the, in their particular case, there was probably sensitivities with regards to the performance and throughput. Yes. How decentralized? So, so Alio itself is a, uh, it's a, uh, well, it's a proof of stake based system. It's a BFT based system. Um, in order to run a system like this, anyone can be a validator, um, and anyone can run a, run a light client. Anyone can run a full node. Um, I would say from that perspective, it's fairly decentralized uh, in the sense that we're permissionless and it's open. Um, granted, because it's a BFT system, block producers can only be restricted to a very small number, like a few hundred, a few hundred nodes can actually be block producers in that model. Um, and this is true of any, any proof of uh, stake based system. But uh, I would say that we, we are no different from existing L1s that are decentralized out there. We currently have a few hundred nodes on the network for testnet three. In testnet two, we had 12,000 nodes on the network. It was pretty wild. Uh, we, were, we were up there next to Bitcoin, uh, but testnet three just kicked off and we'll be running it for the next few months. And so I'm very much looking forward to seeing network activity and seeing what people do. Also, you'll see a lot of people do funny business on there, trying to game things. And it's, it's, always, a, it's always a fun experience to see what people try. It also helps us battle test our stack to be better. Uh, yes, uh, uh, yes, yep. Great, great question. So the, the UTXO model allows you to do concurrency, but one of the biggest challenges is, unless it's a purely for payments, it's really hard to reason about programmatic logic in the UTXO model. I think you've seen with a lot of, uh, with a lot of uh, communities who are building uh, smart contracts onto Bitcoin, um, they have to move it into side chains in order to do far more expressive logic. And for us, one of the things is to say that even if you can do that, the problem is there's no easy way to say I have global state about the, this specific problem program. Like if I want to do Uniswap and I want to aggregate the state of everyone's token contribution so I can see how much is in reserve A, how much is in reserve B, and I can take those numbers to compute the constant product formula, like I don't have an easy way to accumulate that state in the UTXO model. In the account model, it's very easy. Why? Because it just lives right there and the, there's one number that everyone globally updates. And so for us, we said we need to start from, from something that can actually accumulate state and then reason about how to give concurrency from that here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, can you elaborate more about the consensus and also the incentives? Like, how do you really incentivize uh, Great question. So, in terms of the network, um, there's two types of main incentives. There's staking rewards, which are for for anyone. Uh, anyone is allowed to stake and be a validator and, and bond themselves on the network. Obviously, being a proof of stake system, we want to encourage as much uh, as many people to participate in this because it helps to secure the network. Uh, you want to have a high amount of TVL so that you can ensure that the network itself is resistant to potential forking attacks. Um, I'd say on the other front, we have what's called a Coinbase reward. So Alio will be launching its mainnet soon in the, in the coming year. And um, with that, uh, we have this puzzle. It's a Coinbase puzzle. The puzzle itself is meant to improve the performance of zero-knowledge proofs and allow anyone to run what we call a prover. So a prover is similar to a miner in the sense that they're basically computing a puzzle. In this case, it's a zero-knowledge proof-based puzzle in order to try to solve for that and, and add value to the chain. When every time they solve a puzzle, new, new coins are issued into the network. 
and this reward is massive to start and uh, decreases linearly over the first decade. Um, this is, for us, the way that we're introducing uh, supply into the system, and it's something that is open to the public. Anyone can run, anyone can participate in this. Um, currently, uh, this is something that we have not released yet. We're releasing it in phase three of Testnet 3, so Testnet 3 is live. We're going to be releasing the, uh, the BFT and the proving parts coming soon. This will allow anyone to try these parts on, on here right before mainnet. Yes. Great question. So one of the main differences I would say is that, uh, you know, Mina, by the way, is a very cool project. And I, I think that one of the biggest selling points about their design is having these succinct blocks in order to have ultralight clients. In Alio, we are thinking about it from a, from a more Ethereum perspective. So we don't, we don't focus on succinct blocks, but we do focus on private state inside of applications. And so like in that model, privacy can only be achieved off-chain. In Alio, privacy can be achieved on-chain. Um, and with on-chain privacy, what you get is now the same types of, uh, of smart contracts that you're familiar with in Ethereum, but with the ability to either publicly reveal and make transparent or to, to, to privately hide and shield your state. And that's the main difference. Like that, that's a system that I have yet to see in any other L1. And frankly, this was the, also the main contribution of the research paper we worked on. Yes, in the middle. Yeah. Yes. This. You, you hit on a very good point. So in Alio, there's actually two levels of concurrency, which I, which I left out in part because the, the second level of it is actually fairly well motivated. You've already seen it in Ethereum. It's the same idea. So in Alio, we say we execute off-chain, we finalize on-chain. In every piece of logic, and you'll see it in the demos in just a minute here, um, we have the ability to also index into global state after the off-chain computation. So in the Uniswap example, when you need to tally up reserve A and B, um, you have a layer of concurrency that the mempool also gets to decide. So miners, or, or sorry, validators in the network can take transactions and basically aggregate state on-chain on into global maps as well. And you'll see there's these two layers of concurrency. I'll call it out as I'm going through the demo, but um, it, you're absolutely right on that. I, I left. Yeah. Order it after the fact. Exactly, and 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 you know, there's obviously a lot of discussions in terms of MEV and ordering. And one of the things that we've talked about is basically introducing the concept of sequence numbers into the transitions of a transaction, which then allows the application developer to immediately decide up front. You can use, for example, commit and reveal schemes to basically ensure that that ordering cannot be gamed. Um, there's many ways to, to reason about that, but the, the short of it is that, that there's two layers of concurrency. The concurrency I showed is off-chain concurrency, and then additionally, the mempool offers you on-chain concurrency, um, and this is the way that we handle it in Alio. But it's a great question. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yes, in the middle. Great question. So transaction fees are still an intrinsic part of the system. However, it's not based on gas. As you know, gas is basically saying, I'm executing computations, right? So that's why I say this, the, 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 the fee model may look closer to Bitcoin and because of the fact that um, most of the computation you're doing is off-chain as opposed to on-chain. And therefore, what you're really paying for is proof verification. So you know, the more that you pay uh, in your transaction, then the faster or the higher priority you get to get your proofs checked over the next guy's proofs. But all proofs are constant size, constant time. They look the same. And so from that perspective, like it's really you paying for priority over, over everyone else instead of saying how long you want to run a piece of code.
Yeah, so if you want to, so the transaction fee is something that you can choose for yourself. So you can write how much you would like to pay in a transaction, and you can also bump the mempool to update the transaction fee in case you know there's a surge. But the idea is to say that um, because you're paying, uh, what the network is doing is verifying the execution, not actually executing the computation, then what you're paying for is paying for verification. And so you're paying for someone to do your task, which is the same task as the other guy's task, uh, sooner than, 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 than the other person. That's the main intuition there. Yep. Uh, yep, on the left. Yep. Oh, yeah, go ahead. That's a very good point to bring up here. Sorry, I just realized I should leave these up for people. <laughs> um, Great question. So in terms of provers, so the short of it is this. Um, you can execute it yourself. You don't have to send it off to a third party. That's kind of one of the biggest benefits of this design is that the prover is open source. Anyone can run it. However, for most applications, what I anticipate and what we anticipate is that you're going to want to send it to a third party to run it because they can either do it faster, cheaper, or kind of just hassle-free for you. Um, it's a lot like saying in Web2, when I want to host an application, I could run the server on my laptop at home, um, but then I have to leave my laptop running and I, and I can't go do other things, right? So then you have AWS and you say, well, I could then deploy it on a server on AWS and host my application there, in which case AWS runs it for you um, and, and it saves me from having to run it on my laptop and I can do other things with my computer. That's, that's kind of the main intuition in, on, on that front. But provers themselves, uh, uh, um, like the user can be the prover. A third party company can be the prover. There's a delegation scheme in our model that I actually didn't talk about here that can also offer additional privacy guarantees when you delegate. Um, but nonetheless, that there's many ways to, uh, for provers to exist. And, and actually, every one of us with a laptop here in this next, uh, in this next part is also going to be a prover. <laughs> Yes. Great question. So uh, you're absolutely right that you can have the you can you can run into the redundancy issues. So as a as a developer, you need to come up with like a map reduce model where you say I map out to this the swarm uh, with a partitioning logic to say you get these these states, you get these states, you get these states, you get these states, and when you reduce, you're reducing things, and maybe you want to weave it into one transaction or into a sequence of transactions and send those on chain. Yeah. Where I That's a that's a very good point. So so one of the things that we've been looking at for example is doing an off-chain uh, off-chain uh, decentralized exchange and what I mean by that is really a dark pool, right? Because when you have zero knowledge you can make it fully private and in that case you have a bunch of users who are sending in state and you want to execute this uh, simultaneously uh, for all of them, and you want to create the create the final updates on chain. Um, this is where you would end up with like a Kubernetes type of architecture to process this in real time. And yes, the in this particular case, because every u in this model, every user is coming in with their own state, and their own state is fragmented across from from other people's because of the record model. Then it actually prevents you know it, this prevents the provers from end up you know com computing duplicate state. But the short of it is that even if you did do that, you would be able to detect it off chain because um, the transactions have what's called a serial number. So there's a chain of commitments to serial numbers where every time a record's produced, you get a commitment. Every time you spend a record, the commitment turns into a serial number. The commitments and serial numbers are both unique in the system, and you can detect uh, off-chain in your Kubernetes cluster whether, uh, the, the, whether you see two instances of the same serial number, basically. Right, exactly. No, that's a that, that like that that in essence, I believe, is like the short of like when when you receive the request, you want to check that the commitments are unique. If the commitments are unique, you you know that this is a new job. If the commitments are not unique, you know that this is not a new job, and someone's attempting to forge or to double spend or to do something something silly. Um, and that's where you would you would gatekeep them before they even enter into the computing pool. Sure. Yeah, that's the rough guide there. Yep. Yeah, and from the data analysis perspective, is this enough to only prove? 
So they hold everything, so all states. And so th that's where it's similar to Ethereum in that you're holding the entire chain states. Obviously, for like clients, they don't have to hold all of it, so they can just hold the block headers, for example. Um, but nonetheless, like they do hold all state and, and proofs. And then what you plan on any kind of like state charges in the future? We, we've, we've definitely thought about this in part because uh, state here will probably grow quite quickly. <laughs> and so there's definitely discussions on this front. To be frank, uh, we we were kind of looking for advice in terms of what people have seen that's been successful. As you know, sharding is a, a sharding of state in general has been a very, very uh, long thought out process. And in our case, I don't think we're reinventing the wheel there. So like to the extent that people have strong recommendations on how to design that system correctly so that people get availability and access, like we can do that. Like for example, just on the pure networking layer, we're looking at using uh, CADcast in order to do propagations more efficiently than the than the kind of basic gossip protocol that most people are familiar with. And like we're, we're looking for smarter ways to do state storage as well there. So to, to the extent that you have ideas, like I'd be very open to chat about it. All right, um, I realize we maybe went a little over five minutes, but let's jump into part two now. Um, so let me just switch slides here. Part two, part two, part two. And thank you for the questions. They were very good. <laughs> All right. Um, so before we dive in, the first thing I want to say is there will be bugs in the compiler. Fortunately for today's work, you probably won't run into any. We've been fuzzing and decompiling and testing everywhere we can, and it's been getting significantly better. But I do want to say it can be frustrating to debug issues. Um, and please help us file GitHub issues and pull requests if you do run into any as you experiment on Alio. With that, um, prerequisites. Uh, for those who are going to be, uh, be joining us on this front, I want to say that there is basically installing Git, installing Rust, and installing VS Code as the kind of prerequisites. Um, you don't have to install any of this or run with it. What I'm going to be showing you will be also available on GitHub, and you can do this on your own time as well. In fact, the repo that I'm going to be basing all of my uh, demos off of, if I, oops, if I, if I can uh, show it. Is, uh, is this repo here, and I'll post a, uh, you'll see a link for this in the slides. It is a workshop repo here that is the Alio workshop repo, um, and we'll be walking through a few examples here, auctions, basic bank, uh, battleship, tic-tac-toe, a token, uh, since it's crypto, and uh, voting as well. Um, Anthony, did you want to say a quick word? Yeah, do we want them using Discord or uh, um, d Did you check with uh, Colin Ray whether they, or Colin Pranav if they wanted to? Okay, yeah, sure. Do you want to do, do you want to do a quick mention? Hey everyone, uh, my name is Anthony. I'm head of growth at Alio. Uh, basically, uh, during this workshop, if you have any questions or run into any issues, we actually have a channel in our Discord server uh, where you can talk with some of our engineers. So uh, the main thing you'll have to do is just uh, go directly to our Discord. So maybe I don't know if Howard, you just want to. Show them the URL. It's it's just discord.gg backslash. Uh, it links to the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you can do alio.org backslash discord or discord.gg backslash alioHQ. You'll just have to go through a quick captcha. It's very self explanatory when you go to the, the main page. Also, if you didn't create a, an account on Discord, you'll have to do that, but also very self explanatory. And then once you do that, there's a channel. It's just called Developer Workshop. So it should be pretty easy to find it. But just wanted to let people know about that resource in case you need it. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's the URL there, alio.org slash discord. Um, you'll need to go through a capture, as he said. And basically, uh, did, did you mention the, the name of the, the channel? Yeah, so it's just called Developer Workshop. It's called Developer Workshop. So if you go into Developer Workshop and you run into any compilation issues, any installation issues, just flag us and let us know in there and we'll be happy to answer in real time there as well. Okay, um, with that, the second step here is, for those who have VS Code installed, um, I assume you will have already the code shortcut installed, but Code is always a nice thing to have set up, so you want to do that. Um, the, the most important thing on here is to install Leo. So Leo is the plugin that we have here. Um, if you just go into VS Code and you open up the marketplace and you click on um, the, the marketplace icon, this guy here, um, it'll open up the extensions marketplace and you can type Leo in. 
If you type Leo in, you'll see a result, and you can basically just install the, the plugin here. This will give you syntax highlighting. There's an LSP for it. Um, it'll be an easy way for you to quickly uh, get up to speed on that front. And for those who uh, are also ready, um, we have this repo, which is the one that I was just showing. Um, if you just git clone, uh, HTTPS github.com slash alhq slash workshop, this will get you that repo into your terminal. Um, for those who are having trouble using git um, or didn't install the prerequisites, you can also just navigate to this URL here and just click the code icon uh, on the upper right and click download. Uh, and download zip for it, and this will get it to you on your local machine as well. Lastly, um, for those who get workshop installed, if you once you CD in, if you just run dot slash install, that's really it. Uh, it will install the the workshop prerequisites for you. It will install Alio and Leo. That's the main thing that you have to do here. So um, that's all the steps there. Uh, for those who are on Windows, uh, I, I know that there's been some some people who, who may not have all the all the pieces there. So the simpler thing to do is like if you go to GitHub and you just download the zip and you unzip it and you have this folder. If you go into the folder and you just double click install the sh, it will also run the script for you as before. So um, either of those works. And uh, lastly, um, you should open the workshop folder in uh, VS Code, which is just writing code workshop, uh, or code dot, really, if you're in the folder already. Um, and uh, for those who are having trouble, um, you can also go to VS Code, File, Open Folder, and uh, select the workshop folder from your computer and open it in VS Code, so you can follow along as well. Um, I'll be showing it on screen, so this way, if you want to run, run it locally, you can, but also if you, if you want to just watch me do it, by all means. <laughs> all right, let's jump into it. Um, while, while everyone is installing that, and also for those who have questions, just ping the Discord and we'll repeat these steps there as well. Um, I, I want to go through how this programming model works, what Leo looks like, what alien instructions look like, what the AVM looks like, and then from there we'll jump into the live demos and hopefully by that time everyone will have software installed on their computers and we can run it together. That's the goal. Um, the first thing to talk about is just deploying in a, a program on Alio. The short of it is that deployments happen in transactions, similar to kind of how existing, uh, uh, existing L1s work. Um, you basically take your bytecode here, you pack it into a transaction, transaction gets broadcast on chain. Uh, validators on the network will check that the transaction with this code is well-formed. If it's well-formed, it's added into a program registry on chain, it's held there, and then anyone can then from chain pull that program, and in our case, this is where it's new, you can synthesize proving and verifying keys. What are proving and verifying keys? That's basically for the prover and for the verifier. Like that's, if you recall from, from the first few slides on zero knowledge proofs, there's always a prover and a verifier. Here we have the keys for the prover and the verifier. The next step is uh, to execute the uh, Alio program off chain. So a caller, some, some local machine can say, hey, like, I want you to execute this program. Um, you can send it to provers. Again, you yourself can also be a prover, and you can execute this program based on you know state. Provers will execute it typically on dedicated hardware, so it can be anything from GPUs up to FPGAs to ASICs, uh, so that it's faster, more performant, more cost effective. Um, and then they'll output a transaction. That's the execution itself. Once that transaction execution is created, as you can see here, then it gets sent over to the network. Validators will take that transaction. They'll run it. On, on the finalized portion of it, so that's the final layer of concurrency there, and they will basically store state on chain. Because the account model that we have, or the account addressing scheme we have is already a PKI, a public key infrastructure, um, you can then encrypt that state under the account owner as well. Um, but nonetheless, that the caller's uh, response is now available on chain and you can pull it from there. For, for developers and for provers and for validators, there's three different GitHub repos that we use. So if you're a validator, you really want to look at Snark OS. Snark OS is the network. That's what gets you onto Testnet 3 at the moment. Um, for provers, uh, there's Snark VM. Snark VM is effectively this, uh, the, the actual virtual machine. And uh, for developers uh, who want to get into this space and code, like they want to install Leo, and that's uh, what the workshop tutorial is going to be installing for you there. Um, okay, so on a high level, you saw this slide earlier. Leo code compiles to alien instructions. Alien instructions compile down to AVM bytecode. 
And uh, t let me just start by talking about Leo. So what does Leo look like? I'm sure everyone's dying to know. And so the first thing is to say, this is what Leo looks like. You have here um, a scope that says this is for a program. And I have function main with public input x, uh, which is a u64, and some public input y, which is another u64. I can say let z equal to, well, x times y. And I, can, and I can return z. And z itself is returned as a u64 here. This is, on a high level, what this syntax looks like. As, as you can see, we don't need to denote y to be private. Uh, it's private by default. And so uh, if you want something to be public, you have to specify it to be public. This is similar to existing programming languages. Um, so yeah, this just describes what I just said. Uh, you're multiplying x and y into z and outputting z. In Leo, there's 16 uh, primitive data types. So there's algebraic types, like field scalars and groups. Um, there's binary types, uh, like a Boolean. Uh, there's data types, like uh, address and string. And then there's integer types, signed and unsigned, as you would expect. Lastly, Leo also supports custom types. So there's two types of syntax, which you're going to see in the examples. There's something called a circuit and something called a record. These are the two different types of custom structs. Records are owned objects. Circuits are not. Um, and so these are, the, these are the two types that allow you to then custom define new, new data objects with it. Um, here's an example of a circuit type. I can say I want a message with a timestamp, some amount, and a signature. That's like one, one example. Um, and here's like a record type, which could have in it, um, well, it has to have in it actually the first two, owner. So because a record's always owned, it will always have an address associated. Uh, that's the person who owns it. Um, and then there are gates. Uh, gates is actually, in this case, the base denomination of the asset here, of, of the token. So we call Alio credits uh, the, the main token. One Alio credit can be subdenominated into one, uh, one one millionth uh, uh, of a credit, which is one gate. So one million gates equals one credit. Um, that's the gates field. And then lastly, if this is for a token, you want to say how many tokens do you have, and that's the amount field there. You can also combine them. So um, here's an example where I define some payload of a circuit. Um, and then I pass that into state right here. Here's the payload. And I can, I can have a, a record own, own a circuit, for example. Yeah, sorry. So that, so, so that shows you kind of the basic examples there. I think for the data types, most people have seen those data types or most of the data types. And so they can piece together those. The developer docs also cover it in further detail. Um, but into alien instructions. So if we just take this code that we saw from earlier, this Leo code, what does it look like when you compile it down? Well, this is what it looks like. Um, we now have the inputs R0 and R1, which are U64 publics and privates. And then we have here uh, the operation to multiply, uh, which was to multiply into Z, if you recall. So you have R0 and R1. We put that in R2. And then we output R2, which is the U64 private. Alien instructions have all sorts of opcodes. Uh, so we have arithmetic and binary opcodes. There is also assertion opcodes. There are conditional opcodes. There's comparator opcodes. There's commitment opcodes. There's hash function opcodes. And there's also new opcodes being proposed at the moment. So there's a lot of opcodes. Um, the idea here is to allow you to then build your own custom expressive language, which may be Leo, may be something else. Um, you get to kind of extend it how you want to, because there's many domain specific applications that may not need all the opcodes or only wants a subset or wants to provide expressivity that's very restricted or bounded. We want to make this alien instructions um, the kind of starting point for where you bridge off into your own DSLs as you wish. Um, from a high level, Leo is meant to be kind of one opinionated form to show an easy way for people who are JavaScript developers how to get into the space quickly. Um, but obviously, for many, many types of applications that you know, deal with maybe regulation or deal with uh, PII or specific you know, s uh, sensitive data in general, you know, th they can use AL instructions to create a DSL of their own kind to kind of satisfy their own needs there. And lastly, with respect to the uh, AVM bytecode, um, so if we just take this again, well, I mean, it won't be any surprise that when you compile it down, it looks something like this. Um, but this is specifically the AVM bytecode for uh, this high-level uh, instruction stuff. And the, the most important thing is it's a, serializ it's a serialized format um, that is bijective. So there's a bijection between the two, and 
you can map between the two. So what you pull from chain, which is the bytecode, can also be interpreted back into AVM bytecode. And then from AVM bytecode, you can decompile it into Leo if you would like. Um, obviously, you lose richness from the um, AVM bytecode down to Leo since things are, are now register based, so you lose variable names, but you can decompile it if you want in order to read it on an even lower level. And these are things that we're looking to add into the Explorer so that people can easily check and see this stuff. Yeah, there's no debug symbols there, yeah. No tracebacks. No tracebacks. It's, a, it's a pure mathematical model. Everything here compiles down right into polynomials. It's a very, very unique stack. So when people ask, why did we build a new language, you know, the short answer is that in traditional languages, you know, you compile down into a very specific form of bytecode that's executed on a CPU. You know, in our case, we compile down into polynomials that get executed in a proof system. And so th it's just a different type of stack. And unfortunately, things that may sound cheap in a traditional programming language are actually very expensive in, in this context. Things that are very expensive in traditional programming language might actually be very cheap in a context like this because it's just a different domain you're working in. So it's different trade-offs you're working with now. All right, so let's jump into the demos. Uh, for those who are following along on their computers, like uh, the repo that I'm going to be using is the, the workshop repo. So um, that is this GitHub repo here, um, aliohq slash workshop. Um, and I'm just going to be running it uh, uh, straight so that you can see the examples. Um, the first one I want to go through is just tic-tac-toe. For those who are familiar with tic-tac-toe, uh, it's a game where you have zeros and Xs and you're trying to get three in a row. Um, so let me do CD tic-tac-toe. I'm typing with one hand here, sorry. <laughs> All right, uh, and if I just LS, um, you can see that there's a, there's a few folders here. Um, the most important one here is uh, in the source folder. We have here uh, main.leo, uh, main and we have uh, a row. So a row is just what we define as one row in the board, which is a three by three grid. Um, and then a board is just a, a, a composition of rows. Um, with that, uh, I can initialize a new board by just saying, initialize me a new board that, uh, that has here row one, row two, and row three, each initialized to zero. And then we have logic here to check for, check for whether you've won. Um, and it's kind of naturally, naively just checking the actual thing. <laughs> and you can also make moves. And we can also, again, sanity check the, the, uh, the state uh, is an appropriate move. Um, let me run this in order to just show you this working. And it'll, it'll show you each, oops, each step along the way. Let's just run that sh. So we start by just creating a new game of tic-tac-toe. And uh, as we're executing, the first thing we do now is to say, player one has made the first move. So player one place, places an X here, and we're generating a proof about that. Um, that's the proof here. You can see with the outputted execution of, of calling the make move function, uh, which is just this, this function right here. Uh, let me shrink this here. If we just call make move, then we end up with a new state where we have that, that first uh, X right here. Um, in the second step, we have player two is making the second move, and the second move was to go zero. And you can see there is now player two is placed uh, their circle here. Um, then we can go player one makes the third move, and again, you have the X here. It again shows up uh, right here. Um, player four, or sorry, player, player two makes the fourth move. Player one makes the fifth move. Here, let me just have it continue to run here. Uh, this is now at step eight, where we're almost finished with the game. Player two is making the eighth move. And now we're at player one, who's making the ninth move. And we are done. The game is complete, player one and two tied in this model. Um, that should show you a very kind of quick example of how tic-tac-toe works in here. Um, basically, players are calling this function and making a move and passing the board to each other. You can see each time they're, they're effectively returning the board, and the board is, an owned, is, an, is, the, is the owned struct that is then being passed around in order to actually instantiate and kind of create the next, the next move. That's tic-tac-toe. Um, let me show you another example. So let's move up, CD up. And uh, let's go down to the vote contract. So if I go to vote now and close up tic-tac-toe, vote has in it, uh, the basic concept is to say, um, maybe we should go with the readme here, uh, vote. 
Yeah, the, the, the basic concept is you want to do a generalized vote program. The idea is that someone can issue a new proposal. Proposals, uh, proposers can issue tickets to voters. Voters can then vote without exposing their identity. It's a, it's a, blind, it's a blind vote. So here we have you know, the objects. Uh, each example will get more complex, so at some point I won't be able to walk through all of it. But um, I think the most important thing to call out, which is to answer the concurrency question we talked about earlier, is that we do have maps. These maps are the on-chain maps. All maps here are fully public. Um, and as you can see, uh, there are maps for, for um, the tickets that have been casted out, and then also the tally of the agree and disagree votes part. Um, these, these here basically form the premise of, of how you want to tabulate publicly the final votes without leaking off-chain who you voted for. So you can say, when I'm voting off-chain, I voted for some party or, or to vote yes or no, and um, uh, that vote does not reveal the identity of who I am. And then from there, I can tabulate on chain the total sum of yeses and the total sum of noes. Those are public for everyone to see. And this gives you the ability to now have this interaction model where, where each, each side is reasoning kind of only about their own state, but everyone can see global state at the same time. And again, this is up to the, the network, the validators, to actually then, uh, then handle concurrency on that secondary level there. So if I just uh, run this guy, let me clean up my window. Let's go run.sh here. So we start by compiling the vote program, and we propose a new ballot. It's empty at the moment. Um, we are basically calling this function propose in the vote.alio contract. And uh, you can see we are starting by issuing a new ballot ticket. Um, by issuing a new ballot ticket, it places into it zero, zeros. Um, so uh, there's currently no yeses uh, and, and no noes. Um, and we're going to vote yes on one. And so we just call um, agree. Uh, the, the methods here happen to be agree and disagree. Um, so if you agree, then it ends up tallying one for yes, and you can see it's executed, and the vote itself took 1.6 milliseconds, uh, or 1.6 seconds. Um, just, just so you know, this is running on a MacBook Air, so um, it's faster if you're obviously on a MacBook Pro or on a desktop, but it's already within reason, in my opinion. Um, that's the vote example there, and this, is, this, this can let you now start to create tallies for different parties to aggregate states uh, uh, on-chain and basically create global tallies. As you can imagine, there's many use cases for this, especially with regards to prediction markets, with regards to oracles. You may want to start to accumulate state and knowledge for people. You want to know how many people have done something. Like This is a kind of a, a simple mechanic to kind of show you that this is possible on a system like this. The next example I'd like to walk through is a, is, a, is a token one. Oh, I think I might need to get pull here. Let me see. Well, let's come back to the token one. But um, uh, the token one is, is the easiest one. There's like 20 examples of this one already. Um, let's go through a bank example. CD bank. Oh, basic bank. All right, so w what does the bank do here? Well. Um, the bank is effectively just a simple interest yielding account. Um, so what, what do I mean by simple interest yielding account? Um, the bank can issue tokens that you own in your wallet off chain that are not in your account. You can then call a deposit function to move tokens into your bank account. Once you've moved it in, you can then also calculate the interest rate for it can, it can accumulate interest in your account and you can accumulate out interest that's paid to you when you withdraw. That's the basic intuition of this, and, and you will see uh, how this works. Obviously, a huge disclaimer is don't create a bank account program on Alio using this code here because it's meant for demo purposes. There's many, we call that many reasons why you should not use this, uh, but uh, it's more to illustrate the point that I can not only create very simple mechanics uh, on chain to actually uh, implement a, a, a bank like this that has privacy, but also to show that I can compute these interest rates in a private context too. So let's just take a look at the source code here. Um, we have here a basic token that the bank is using. Um, we have here a global map of the balances here. We can issue out tokens. Um, we can also deposit tokens. And, we can, uh, and, and this is where it's worth calling out. We have something called function, and we have something called finalize. So uh, with regards to that concurrency question, again, just to call out, there's one layer of concurrency that's being resolved in the function scope because Tokens are themselves records, so you can manage concurrency with respect to your state versus the other guy's state in a program. But even separately, 
finalizes what the network runs. So after you've completed this, then you, you end up finalizing. And, and when the network is finalizing this for you, it's effectively going to do an increment here. It's an operational transform. And, it's, and it gets to basically currently choose you know, how to order the increments if there's multiple parties um, uh, creating this. But as you can see, concurrency is available on two separate layers because of this. Lastly, we have here the withdraw. Um, the withdraw method basically takes in an assertion that checks, hey, like this is really you, um, and uh, uh, basically computes the interest. Uh, the calculate interest function is down here below. Um, this is what we use, and you can provide it the principal, the rate, and the periods with which it's, it's coming from. Um, and then you issue out a new token with the amount, and uh, again, you finalize by decrementing, so you remove their bank account balance from it. Let's go ahead and run this to show, show uh, it live. So uh, there's a lot here. Let me just hit pause. Um, there is, uh, we're going to start by initializing 100 tokens for this address. And we put dot, dot, dot just to truncate it. Um, so we say the action is that we're issuing um, for this wallet some amount. The bank for this person is 0 at the moment. As you can see, we set the interest rate to be 1.234. Um, and uh, the total balance for this guy is 100 right now. They have 100 off chain in their own wallet. The bank on chain does not have anything held. As I'm executing, you can see here's the first step. What we do, or the second step, what we do is we deposit 50 tokens. So now we're saying the action is we're depositing. Um, so we just debited 50 from the uh, users, uh, or the users themselves debited 50 from their account in order to deposit it into the bank. And from the bank, the balance is now, uh, the total is still 100, still preserved. Zero periods have passed, so not, no interest has been issued. Here we say, we, let's wait for uh, 15 periods. So we did no new action here. All we did was let time pass. And the balance has incremented to 266 based on the interest calculation rate of that function below. And the result is now 316 to uh, total tokens, 50 of which are off-chain, 266 of which are on-chain. And finally, uh, the uh, account can go and withdraw. So then, then this user says, hey, I want to withdraw all of it. They can call 266. Um, and then effectively, the wallet returns back the total balance of 316. They end up with 316. But the important thing is that the balance here is 0. That's been wiped out. That's the, that's the main premise here. Um, and you can see that the executions, I should probably be calling out the run times for these, since that's a big deal for people. Um, issuing took about 1.6 uh, seconds on this MacBook Air, um, two seconds to deposit on the MacBook Air, um, and uh, four seconds to withdraw on the MacBook Air. So th these are still within kind of fairly, fairly human times to, to do it. <laughs> All right, next I want to show a basic auction contract. Um, this auction contract is, uh, is a two-party auction where two parties can bid and there's an auctioneer in charge. So you have an auctioneer who starts an auction, two parties will bid, uh, one will bid a number that's higher than the other, the auctioneer will call out who the winner is, and then after the winner is called, then we are going to finish, uh, finish, the, finish the auction. And uh, just to show you what this looks like, there's a place bid where we say ensure the caller is the auction bidder. So um, this just checks that the address here is also self.caller. Um, we have here a resolve function, which is to resolve the winning bid. So you place in those two bidders and you just call out who the winning bidder was. And lastly, you can finish by just saying, hey, like, like let's set the is winner flag to be true here for this guy. So he's done and he can go walk and go claim his you know, prize or token or whatever he was bidding on effectively. Um, let's run this example. So, oh, sorry, here, let me just clear it out and run it cleanly. All right, so we're starting by initializing a new two-party auction. The first bidder here is going to place a bid of 10. And uh, you can see it, oh, yeah, it's moving a little too quick. It's executing. Uh, it took about 1.7 seconds. Um, then the second bidder decided, hey, I want to place, place a bid of, I want to place a bid of 90. So he places a bid of 90. And now you have two bids. One is at 10, one's at 90. Um, the auctioneer can then select the bidding winner. Um, and so that's the arrows here. S shows that B uh, uh, at 90 is the winner. 
And then uh, the auction, though, is still open. As you can see here, it's still open. So um, then we've basically resolved to finish the auction. And finally, the winner has been, has been deemed and the auction has been closed. Um, that's the basic example of just an auction contract here. Um, lastly, let's do Battleship. This one's quite, quite uh, elaborate, and I would actually encourage for those who are very interested in Battleship to read through this because there is, uh, it's a very, very played out example. Um, I will just say there's, a, yeah, there's many steps, but the basic premise is to say we're going to have two parties play a game of Battleship, and they're going to play uh, four rounds of Battleship for the sake of time here. Um, but uh, the, the basic premise is that um, you need to start by having players uh, go and um, uh, uh, place their pieces on the board. So party, the first party, the first player places their, their pieces on the board. Once those pieces are on the board, it's handed over to the next player. The second player takes that board, adds their pieces onto the board, and sends it back to the first player to now start the game. So once you start the game, you basically start adding, you, you know, you start taking hits, and, and you, you'll see, you'll see uh, the, the play out of it from, from each side. They'll place four rounds uh, of this game before we just halt it. To, uh, it's already nine steps in just to show you what it looks like. Um, but yeah, just to give you an overview, there's a, there's a lot of instructions here and, you can, and you'll see what the board looks like. So here's like an example of what the board looks like. It's just all zeros and then there's, uh, there's, uh, there's a few ship pieces that you can see that are being placed here. So there's, uh, these are being placed actually right next to each other. There's one of two, one of three, one of four, one of five. And so that's uh, four, four ships, each of different sizes. Yeah, there's a lot of descriptions. I, I recommend for this one that you take a look at the README to, to see it, but let me, let me just walk you through uh, it live so that we can see it in action. If I cd into battleship, I clear it, slash run.sh. All right, so the first step that we're going to do is we're going to initialize player one. Player one starts placing ships on the board, and they're executing. You'll see that this one actually takes a bit longer because of the fact that it's quite a complex thing. It's doing multiple pieces. So you can see we're placing here four pieces. It's placing four pieces and it's creating the board with the four pieces that have been placed. And so it's executed the function new board state. That, that basically completes that first step. Um, once that first step's done, now we're gonna pass, now player one is passing the board over to player two. And if we look at the printouts from this, it will once again do the same thing. It's going to start the board, start the game. Now, player two's turn is to place the ship on the board. So what does it do? Well, just as before, we need to go and, uh, and add the pieces. So we validate each piece that we're adding. We're checking it. it takes about one and a half seconds for each of those pieces there. Um, and then we create the board, and it's effectively done there. So now player one and player two have both placed their ships on the board. Now we're passing the board back to player one so that player one can actually start their turn. Um, and in here, so we basically are calling the start board and start game methods for real this time. <laughs> and, uh, oops, and uh, start battleship. And so now we're starting the game. Um, player one starts taking their first turn. And uh, we can see. Update uh, played tiles. Update hits and misses. <laughs> Create the move. And we hit play. And uh, that, that sequence, and so what the sequence is doing is effectively um, making account for um, what the current game state looks like, what the current set of uh, hits and misses on the board has been so far. It then goes and creates the move, which is to say, I want to sync a spe specific uh, uh, spot, but because I don't know where they are on the other side, I need to first cache it in there. And then I basically hit play to say, execute all this for me. For the next guy who takes it, I'm taking state from the previous guy and executing based on the state that was just provided in order to, again, update state on my side to say, ah, I got a hit or I got a miss. And because it's all cryptographically bound, that's, that's where the ZKP comes in, the zero knowledge proof comes in, that I can't cheat on the move that I'm making. That's the, that's the kind of crux of the idea here. So now player two takes their turn, does the exact same thing, 
and they end up playing, then there's player three, and now we're currently on the last step, which is player four playing their turn. Um, and uh, this game is not done yet. The, in total, because there's uh, uh, two, three, four, and five, uh, that's uh, 14 uh, total uh, steps uh, that you have to take in order for the first winner to be declared. It would take a while to demo it, but this at least starts to illustrate for you how Battleship works in a game, uh, in, a, in a construct like this. And this is, the, this is the final outcome there, and we executed two rounds of player one, two rounds of player two in this example. Um, now, let me see if I can get pull. Yeah, exactly. That's the that's the basic premise here. Is that is that um, what I'm showing you is what you can see, which is which is own, which is really nothing that I can't see the other opponent's board. Um, and in this model, like the way that that you're actually doing is, I'm encrypting that state under my account. So because of that, only I can see my state. But I have to reason because of the the game logic that we've all agreed upon in the program. I have to execute this logic. I have to take his move and process it against my game state and send this back over to the other party for, for, for reasoning there. So like the intuition is that you, you can't see each other, if that makes sense. So I believe there is actually, oh, it's probably on a branch. Where we may need to, here, let me, one second. I actually have not run this one, so let's see how it how it goes. <laughs> but this is for a token contract now, and this one is a uh, this is a this is a very straightforward example. Actually, um, here we have the th this is like a canonical thing that people want to do as a token. So there's two ways to represent a token. You can either represent a token as a mapping or as uh, as a record. When it's a mapping, this is very ERC twenty like in the sense that what I'm doing is holding uh, some amount of tokens uh, to an address on chain. Uh, in the record approach, uh, what this is saying is I am uh, basically going to assign to you uh, a record that belongs to you that you, you can manage with uh, your address, um, the uh, total number of ALO credits, uh, gates in there, and then lastly the token amount. Uh, once you have that, uh, there's two unguarded mint functions which I can walk you through, mint public and mint private. So in the mint public case, what am I doing? I'm effectively um, passing in who am I minting money to and how much. We call finalize on it, and oh, oh, it's scrolled over, here we go. And we can go to the finalize scope here, take, the, take that same uh, interface and pass it in by saying increment the mapping account, which was, uh, was up there, um, by the, for the receiver and this amount. And what it will do is basically go look into the map uh, account. It'll say, hey, like I need a receiver, which is uh, this, uh, this address, and pass it in and say, okay, increment by this amount, which is the given amount. Um, if the uh, account of receiver does not exist, it will be created. If it overflows, the entire call here is reverted, um, and it will increment basically from zero going up if it's new. If you want to do a mint that's to uh, for a private token, even easier, just return token on owner, gates, and amount. That's kind of so self-explanatory there for, for the mint private case. Um, now let's do a transfer. If I want to transfer here, what I can do is say I, I, there's a sender, there's a, uh, there's a receiver, and an amount. In our case, uh, the caller is already known, so uh, if we assume that we're transferring from ourselves, we just pass in self.caller, we pass it through here into this interface, and, and we basically pass in to decrement for this account, the sender and the amount, um, and we want to increment uh, for the receiver the same amount. Uh, in either case, if we underflow or if we overflow, the entire call is reverted. Uh, and this is, a, this is obviously kind of how you would naturally want to do that um, to make sure that you're not uh, minting money out thin air or ending up in a limbo state. Um, for transfer private, uh, it's a similar construct. The idea is that I pass in a record, which is the token. Um, then I say there's a receiver and some amount. Uh, I'm basically saying, first off, what's the leftover? The difference is like the change that I'm getting back. 
Um, so that's the remaining. Um, and here we, we start by creating a token with the difference, which is just my leftover tokens. And then we also create a new token, which is for the receiver. The receiver is the amount that they're going to get. And then we return both the amount for myself and the amount for the new, new person as well. What's cool about this model is now we also have transferring from private into public and public into private. Um, what this means is like if I have private tokens and I want to make them public, I can transfer them into the on-chain state and have it held there, which means it's now public and everyone can see I own this amount in here. But I can also do the opposite, which is I can move public tokens into a private record as we just described, so I own it privately. If you think about it from a Uniswap contract, if I want to deposit into Uniswap, what I could do is to say I want to deposit um, some private tokens into a public Uniswap account. I then have a claim tag that the Uniswap program could give me to actually go use it. It's like it's like my like kind of like your LP token, so to speak, but more so for actually trading. It's your liquidity tokens. I can then use those to trade with. And when I'm done trading, I can pull out some private amount under my address, and this can actually prevent the, for everyone else from knowing who I was when I was using Uniswap, but it reveals to everybody the trade that's happening. And, and this is the type of new public-private disclosure that you can use in a model like this by using primitives like this. Lastly, you have the transfer public to private, and that would be like the withdrawal casing. I'm moving out from the Uniswap contract into some private, private token, and I can put the address as a private input and basically like uh, get, get yourself a get yourself a, a, um, the, the final value from that. But th these, are the, these are the different ways that you can utilize um, just a token contract here. Um, I'd say like the, the, the model, oh, and I should, I think I ran it, yeah. So here, let me do a quick check here. Yeah, so we can say we want to publicly mint 100 tokens for Alice. And uh, we have some public balances here that are going to be minted. We can privately mint and uh, for Bob, and that goes there, um, we can also Again, do the transfer, and you go 90-10. You can also transfer 20, uh, which goes 80-20. Um, you can transfer 30, uh, which then moves over 60 to, uh, 60 to 10, and uh, sorry, 60, 10, 20, and one, 110, so 60 and 110. Um, and then you can also convert 40 of the private tokens from Bob into 40 public tokens, and you can move them over, over to, to Alice. And those are the main examples there. And these, this is the token contracts. These are, these are all available on the GitHub workshop there. Um, I believe I'm coming up on time here, so I'm just going to wrap up by saying uh, this is the Alu GitHub repo. Um, for those who are interested, the repos that we were just talking about are all available here. There's Snark OS, Snark VM, there's Alio, which is the uh, underlying Alio instructions, and there's Leo, which is the programming language. You can install these just by coming to the repos and doing it, or going into the workshop repo and hitting dot slash install dot sh. Um, but with that, I think I'm out of time, and uh, just want to say thank you very much. Oh, nice. Oh, I thought it was two thirty. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, if we if we still got time, I'm happy to answer questions. Then, uh, yes. Uh, like a like a front end, you're saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So currently, we don't have front ends that are baked into this. People have built their own applications. Actually, like there's like uh, uh, I don't know if I still have it here, but there's a yeah. I don't have it on here. There's, there's an example of roulette actually someone recently built where they have a house and they have a player and they have a spinning wheel. And, uh, but yeah, these are, uh, this is where I would say you normally plug into traditional uh, front ends for that. So that was a React-based application. Oh, like an, yeah, so we've discussed this. Currently, we aren't doing an ABI, but we do want to do one. And the reason for that is to standardize um, the interfaces for explorers, uh, for wallets, and for exchanges so that everyone is kind of on the same page about what, what to expect as the call, call interface. So this is absolutely something that we're, we're currently working through. It doesn't exist at the moment. We're just in our early days. But um, we do have a, um, uh, like a, an RFC process. We call it ARCs, so ARC, uh, Alien Request for Comments. And so uh, if you're interested to help contribute to that, um, the GitHub repo is just uh, github.com slash aluhq slash arcs. Yep. Um, any other questions? Yes.
Ah, uh, for which example is this one? For tic-tac-toe. If it, yes, yeah, so, so currently, it, so what it's doing in that example is you'll see that the nonces are actually mismatched and the, the, the point to make there is that when I'm executing it there, you should be passing in the state of the first call and piping it in for the second, from the second into the third, third into the fourth, but all of this can execute purely off chain. Uh, you can create a sequence of transitions that then get put into one transaction that's broadcast on chain. So in this model here, like what we're, what we're showing is purely off chain, the sequence of transitions that are being executed. Uh, it shouldn't need to download 100 megabytes every time. That might that might be a bug. I, I thought you were more wondering about the state transition, but but yeah, if if it's downloading, I'll come take a look right after. I, I'm very interested to know. I haven't seen that bug before. Okay. Yeah. This is a great point. So in uh, in Snark VM, we do have some CUDA implementations. I'll say it's very very early and very bare bones. So like the performance of it is not that much better than CPUs. I know outside, uh, other people in the community have already created versions that are 2x and 2.5x faster than CPU. And so, you know, we obviously encourage people to do that. With the um, Coinbase puzzle that we'll be releasing that allows anyone to run a prover and, and earn tokens for, for running efficient provers, uh, I anticipate people will go into FPGA uh, domains kind of very quickly from there. Yes. Yeah, so, so basically um, every one of those calls needs to be broadcast as a transaction on chain. Uh, once it's confirmed on chain, then what happens is that it, it will update the state. So if it's a private token, the only thing that gets updated is the fact that there's a new record commitment that was produced. If you're spending a private token, you're, you're, you're producing a serial number that the record was, was consumed. But if you're doing the public versions, then the maps on chain get updated so that you increment or decrement depending on whether you're minting or transferring. Exactly, and that new record will live on chain, but it'll be fully encrypted, and the only thing that you'll know is the commitment. The commitment is like your ID into that encrypted uh, record, and so only you, uh, as the owner of the record, can go and decrypt it and see that record again. Exactly. Exactly. So if you look at the record outputs that are being put there, one is going to be sent to the to the receiver, the other, the record owner is the sender, right? When we encrypt, it's encrypted under the receiver's address. And then in our case, it's, re re uh, it's encrypted under the sender's address. Because that is your public key and I can encrypt under your public key, like that is what you're encrypting under. So the, the first record will then belong to you, the second record will belong to me. Uh, so you get the, the new record and I get the, I get the leftovers. Uh, so exactly, yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yep. Right, so, so you get encrypted state about the other board, but you can't really see it, right? But you, can, you get your decrypted state about your board, and you get the move that was being made from them that is also public to you. You're obligated to process you know, their move correctly, otherwise the proof will return false. So you have to process that really they hit your ship or really they, they missed your ship. And then from there you have this new state that is also cryptographically bound to say like this is my new, my new board state on my side which then gets sent over to the other player to then make their next move. Yeah, the, the latter, the latter, yeah, yeah. Because like the idea is to say like you, you basically have one board that has full state encapsulated and you're just accessing the parts you need to it, but you obviously have to copy over everything and so it'll it'll transfer all of that over and, and that's that's just creating, it's kind of like in normal programming you have a new struct and you just copy over the objects that you aren't breezing over it as part of that so that way the next guy can use it as well. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. So. 
Um, the short of it is that uh, there is this, it's, it's called non-native uh, arithmetic, uh, like uh, th it's, uh, it's definitely an option to do that here. What you're effectively doing is uh, writing code that simulates like in a bitwise fashion the actual execution of another, of another curve uh, inside of your curve. Um, this is doable. Uh, we actually, uh, we, in testnet 2, we actually use this to uh, create uh, proofs uh, about states uh, on another curve or, or on two different curves which don't exist anymore. But the short of it is that's doable. It's very expensive. It's, it's like, I, I'd say like maybe 10 times the actual cost of what it should be roughly. So it is theoretically doable. It is practically doable. But in, but in reality, like, uh, it's it's a it's a big cost to go and make that make that jump there, and that's where like there's obviously new new approaches within pure academia and in the research domain of trying to design systems that can be more kind of bit based, so that you can actually kind of on a boolean boolean kind of construct uh, navigate multiple curves uh, based on what you want. Yeah, so this is definitely something that we've been experimenting with. Um, we, we have thought about basically deploying multiple systems here that can interoperate with each other, but it's certainly very early days. And right now we're basically going to get this one out and then we're going to reason about it. So on the Ethereum side, like they're going to be, uh, they have BN2, uh, BN, BN128, for example, or BN254 um, as the main curve that's integrated there at the moment. Uh, like we've obviously been pushing for them to also add this curve in BLS12377. Um, it's actually ourselves, Filecoin, Cello, and a few others who are all, all wanting this specific curve in because we use it. Um, but uh, there's also BLS 12381, which is the other curve that's out there that they're using. So um, like at the moment, it's an open discussion. I certainly encourage or hope that uh, people will kind of help to navigate this because it's a community effort to, to get those in. But um, from our side, we're also looking at avenues to, to do this. So we've also thought about using uh, quorum, quorum networks that can handle light clients of multiple chains and for them to do a threshold signing on ECDSA, DDSA, Schnorr, et cetera. Um, this way you can then also interoperate in other ways as well. One more in the back. Great question, and it hasn't been asked yet. Um, the short answer is yes, uh, but the long answer is uh, currently no. Um, the way you do it is that in an off-chain, in the, in the function scope, you want to basically write uh, the, uh, Alberto, you, like can you, hear me? you want an opcode that can basically can me, like encrypt for you, and then you pass the encrypted okay. state into finalize. Obviously, from there, you won't be able to do any further computations Alberto, uh, with that state, uh, unless you have homomorphic encryption, in which case you can do some, you know, PHE is obviously very practical, and you can do that today in here. But uh, 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 we do want to add on-chain global private uh, state maps as well. Um, but the lift for that is obviously very high, and so like that's a, that's a later to come feature. But yes, very good question. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I know I'm one minute past now officially. So um, thank you again. Really appreciate it, and uh, please check it out. Um, yeah. Thanks.